This video is going to be a commentary slash film study look at what exactly the Seattle Seahawks may be getting in the hiring of new head coach Mike McDonald, formerly the defensive coordinator for the Baltimore Ravens for two years. As a Ravens content creator, I have significant uh, experience or attempts at observing, classifying, and evaluating uh, the defense that the Ravens ran under Mike McDonald. Obviously impressed like everybody else is in the football world with what he was able to accomplish as a defensive coordinator here. His initial coaching experience was at Georgia, University of Georgia, after I think two years spent coaching high school. And then moves on to coach with the Ravens from 2014 to 2020, serving the last four years there as a defensive backs coach and then inside linebackers coach under Wink Martindale from 2018 to 2020. Moved over to Jim Harbaugh's staff at Michigan in 2021, defensive coordinator, almost like a hired gun, and of course they had great success there. And in his one season under Jim at Michigan, they had a top 10 defense there and reached the college football playoffs. Returns to Maryland to coach uh, the Ravens again, uh, taking Wink Martindale's place as the Ravens defensive coordinator after 2021 season and led a true paradigm shift from the really the extremely aggressive blitzing heavy man coverage scheme that Wink relied on pretty much no matter who the Ravens had at DB that week. And, that, and look, that scheme worked to an extent. In 2019 and 2020, it was spe spectacular. When Wink Martindale had a healthy Marcus Peters to pair with Marlon Humphrey and a healthy Jimmy Smith, he could play that heavy man-free scheme. When those guys were around, his system was successful and caused a lot of concern and consternation for offensive coordinators in terms of how to execute concepts to get receivers open uh, while protecting the quarterback. The downfall was when one of the high-level guys or more was out or injured, such as happened in 2021. Peter's ACL injury, Jimmy Smith uh, getting up in age. If you're a Seahawks fan, you don't know who Jimmy Smith is. Super um, talented player, made the game-winning stop against the 49ers in the Super Bowl in 2012. By 2018, 19, and 20, health concerns, missing more games. But when he was there with a healthy Peters and Humphrey, the Wink Martindale system worked. By the end of 2021, though, the Ravens defense was just giving up huge chunks of yards in the pass game, and Wink showed no ability to adjust. Witness Joe Burrow's combined stats in 2021 and their two wins over Baltimore that year. I offer all of this to inform you of the large strategic shift that McDonald brought with him back to Baltimore. One that, to be very general here, will allow you to survive with lesser talented DBs on the field. Now, Seattle doesn't have that. They have extremely talented DBs. So I think that there will be a time period where things quite obviously click. And in terms of when he came back to Baltimore in 2022, that was right around midseason of his first year as a D.C. with the Ravens. The final 10 games of 2022, Baltimore allowed 15.6 points per game under Mike McDonald. Now, that also includes three different touchdowns that the offense allowed in the form of a 99-yard fumble return for a touchdown by Sam Hubbard in the Ravens wildcard playoff loss in Cincinnati. A strip sack recovered the week before by the Bengals in the regular season finale when Baltimore played without Lamar Jackson, arrested a lot of starters. And then a third time where the Bengals got the ball inside the tent after another offensive turnover. Point being, from midseason to the end of the year 2022, Mike McDonald's defense was lights out. And 2023 even took it to another level. I'm telling you all that information because the defensive system is built for anyone with NFL-level talent, that is, to be able to come in there and not get taken advantage of consistently. As a head coach, with the experience that he's drawn, I would say that there will be some deficits in terms of going up against other co head coaches in the league who've been around for 15, 20 years as a head coach. But in the Seahawks division, uh, that won't happen. You have the Rams, 49ers, and Cardinals all with young head coaches. So it's a super interesting dynamic there. If you ask me, McVay is 36. Gannon and Shanahan are both in their early 40s. So interesting dynamic in terms of how long those four guys will all be in the same division. Theoretically, you could have multiple matchups between coaches in their 40s for another six years, or 40s or less, and which is kind of crazy. If each team meets expectations, which is, sounds mutually exclusive, you can't have all four teams in a division succeed. 
I would say that it's probably in McDonald's best best interest to bring in an experienced offensive coordinator, coordinator that just totally handle that side of the ball. Uh, Eric Bieniemy makes sense to me, but I know that that name's not in consideration. I'm talking about someone who's ran a system and has built in adjustments with that system and teaching progression such that Mike McDonald won't need to be involved at all. But I know that this for the Seahawks, it's an interesting uh, dilemma. They have a had a heavy tight end personnel offense last year. From a tactical standpoint, uh, what I think I can offer for you as a Seahawks fan here is how Mike McDonald's defensive system operates and what perhaps makes it unique among other NFL teams um, right now. So, number one, he will operate out of a too high structure or too high platform often, a shell, if you will. And in my opinion, his, his defense seems to be running plays much the same way that offenses do, meaning they have a large selection of coverages to run, and they're going to run them efficiently. I expect that there'll be a learning curve, and I referenced that earlier on in 2022 with the Ravens. The learning curve was up to about week nine, week eight or week nine. Think of, from an offensive standpoint, there's a wider net of possibilities in terms of the coverage on each snap, which offers a lot of positives for the defense. Clearly, if your players can execute them all on command, and stay in relationship with the receivers that enter their area, you really force the quarterback to process things post-snap in a way that allows the pass rush to get there. Some of the defenses he plays can be recognized easily, obviously, and I have them listed here kind of by category. Down at the bottom, zone coverages. Tampa 2, cover 3, cover 2, and then 2 deep, 4 under, which I will show some film of here in a little bit, that will illustrate to you um, that it's Somewhat of an anomaly compared to what a lot of other teams play. Plays a lot of quarters and split field coverages that I think are hard to quantify, at least for me, um, unless you get really distinct routes on both sides of the field that illustrate or show you the, re- the DB's reactions are different to each side of the field. I think that what you're looking at is a guy who is trying to slow down quarterbacks processing post-snap. And look, they play a lot of man also that's that's listed up at the top. So when the better man coverage guys are available, which you have plenty of them there in Seattle, in my opinion, then he'll adjust and play some more man. If a backup corner is out there, however, on a high-quality receiver, the benefit of McDonald's system is this. He has built-in schematic options that week or that possession or that quarter to limit your exposure to big plays. Now, that sounds like common sense, but I can offer you a certain perspective here because Wink Martindale did not do that. And even inside of our successful seasons, defensively 2019 and 2020, there was weeks where certain guys weren't healthy and we still played the same coverages. Mike McDonald is going to force you as a coach, offensive coach and quarterback, to process things no matter who's on the field and be very multiple. He's running plays on the defensive side the same way the offense is. And if you look at 2023, you had three safeties out there for the Ravens, lurking and being multiple, Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams, and Geno Stone. That trio combined for 12 interceptions this past year. I would say for the Seahawks with Julian Love, Diggs, and multiple other DBs that they have out there, they have talent to be able to do some a lot of the things that the Ravens did well on the back end. With Witherspoon and Woolen, presumably the outside corners, but look, Trey Brown's a spectacular player. And I'll be honest with you, I was personally disappointed in the film of Tariq Woolen from 2023. I thought he looked less disciplined in terms of his technique and relied on using his hands in situations where his feet or focus seemed to get him out of position. Now, this may all not be exactly what Seattle fans are looking for if you're checking out this video, so feel free to check out other content creators. I'm sure you have at this point, but there's a significant talent there. There's significant talent there for McDonald to use on defense immediately, and the draft is going to be a big indicator as to what they'll do on offense and who um, they look at as the guys they're going to rely on. Geno Smith, I think, at this point is on the books for two more seasons at plus $30 million each. Mike McDonald's entire professional and college coaching career has been on the defensive side, dating all the way back to his time at University of Georgia, 2010 to 2013. So there's significant focus that I'm not going to go to here, which is 
How does this Seattle staff figure out how to best structure and maximize Geno Smith's talents? I think having Pete Carroll around in an official capacity, if I understand it right, will be a huge help here and one that I think McDonald will rely on um, often. I can't offer anything to you in terms of how he deals with the offense because there's just no film towards that end at all. What I can do here, if you're interested or intrigued, let me know, um, is I can package plays together that show you how multiple the defense is going to be, and perhaps you can glean some of the patterns or sequences that are there in terms of what parts of the field and what situations does Mike McDonald play these coverages. Going to look at the coverages and the blitzes he uses, maybe speculate about how some of these younger guys that you're seeing on screen here. Um, and, look, my, one of my favorite players to watch film, Boye Mafe, I think he's going to explode in this system. If you're a Seahawks fan, depending on what defensive staff has been retained, and I have no idea, a name that you're going to want to think about is Chuck Smith. Now, the Ravens have him under contract, I believe, for 2024 as the outside linebackers coach. They call him Dr. Rush. I think he had a tremendous impact on the coaching staff in 2023. If you're looking for a hire that will supplement or, and, or grow exponentially what Mike McDonald is able to do with this, def- with this young defense, Chuck Smith will be the guy. Now, personally, I hope you don't hire him. I don't I hope you don't get him, but I'm just letting you know. I think, look, Uchenna Nwosu will obviously uh, benefit from this system. This system in two years in Baltimore, 2022-2023, produced 48 and then 60 sacks with the following guys either posting career highs or getting right around that 10-sack number that they had not reached consistently in their career. So I'm talking about Justin Matabike, Justin Houston, who left after 2022, and then Kyle Van Noy and Jadavion Clowney, who they brought in in 2023, and all those guys did was post essentially 10 sacks apiece. I believe the Seahawks have the talent to execute the system, to install all of it, and get it running in much the same manner that the Ravens had it running by mid to late season 2022. But I think it'll be a drastically different de- defensive system for Seattle than what they ran uh, previously. All right, so number one, you're generally going to be talking about operating out of a two-high platform. Now, this is film of the Ravens against the Bengals, Week 5, 2022. Doesn't necessarily look like a two-high platform. Initially, Pepe Williams rolls to a half-field safety uh, right before the snap and then thereafter. Now, I'm showing you this film, this play specifically first, and then the next one, which is very similar to it because the versatility in the alignment, it certainly looks like, or they're trying to sell man-to-man look pre-snap. And then what happens is Marcus Williams, a very high-priced safety that the Ravens still have under contract, is going to roll and be the the middle-of-the-field Mike linebacker in a Tampa 2. So Tampa 2, you've got two corners in the flats, a hash defender, hash defender, which is the two inside linebackers. In this case, this is before the Ravens had acquired Roquan Smith. So you're talking about Patrick Queen is going to be on the left hash for the defense, and Malik Harrison is going to be on the right hash for the defense. Marcus Williams is going to run between the hashes and be the middle of the field defender in a Tampa 2. Kind of doesn't make sense to say a middle of the field defender in a Tampa 2, but really a Tampa 2 is a cover 3 in disguise. Another way that Mike McDonald will show one look pre-snap and get into a second look We're going to talk specifically about Marcus Williams here. This is same game, week five, 2022. Previous snap I showed you, Marcus Williams was lined up pretty much in the same location, except you had Patrick Queen lined up over here, and then Malik Harrison, number 40, I'm trying to write as neat as I can, lined up here. Recall that Williams rolled to the middle of the field in between the hashes, and Queen and Harrison were the guys who dropped out on the hash. Well, here's Queen, here is Williams, same exact coverage, Tampa 2 post-snap, except different guys in different places. This is Marcus Williams. Recall on the previous snap, he was the guy running between the hashes. Now you have Patrick Queen executing that same responsibility. I have to believe that there's periods of time in practice where Mike McDonald says, for the next eight minutes or the next 10 minutes, we're going to run Tampa 2 or we're going to run cover 3, and we're going to go through all our variations and ways that we do it. Basically what I'm telling you is he'll play the same coverage three or four or five different ways So this is a very multiple defense. The players have to be versatile, however, however, because 
not only is it multiple in coverage, you have multiple versions of the same coverage, which is all done, if you ask me, to make these players, the quarterback, have to process that information post-snap as quickly as possible, and there's just often too many possibilities for them to go through in terms of who's covering the flats, who's playing the hash, who's running between the middle between the hashes in the middle of the field in a Tampa 2. Like I described on the first play, in the case of Marcus Williams, and the second play, Patrick Queen. These are things that the Ravens did nothing of in 2021 prior to Mike McDonald showing up. They did not do these things at all. So the players that were retained from 2021 to 2022 had to adjust and adapt in the same way that Seattle Seattle's players will in off-season camps and training camps in 2024. That's why I picked these two plays to illustrate to you. These are things the Ravens did nothing of prior to Mike McDonald's arrival as a defensive coordinator in 2022. I have significant film organized and labeled already of the Ravens versus the Bengals. Naturally, they are uh, division rivals, number one. Number two, Joe Burrow tore us up in 2021. Part of Mike McDonald's job was to slow down his processing as best he could. Another way that he, I think, causes delays in quarterbacks' ability to go through things is playing somewhat abnormal defenses, and this is one that I would call that. Another too deep coverage, but this case, two deep and four under. Now, the player I want you to focus on here, this is an incomplete pass, by the way, up the right sideline. Great throw from Joe Burrow, but that's Jadavion Clowney, who is an outside linebacker slash D-end, asked to drop out in coverage. Of course, every team does these things, drops out their D-ends, OLBs in coverage. Clowney's going to drop from here to the hash. Darby is going to be the cover two corner sitting here. And then this safety is going to roll to half field from the mug look. Mug look meaning five, six, seven, eight players on the line of scrimmage. Not sure who's going to blitz, who's going to uh, go after the quarterback, who's going to drop out in coverage on this third and seven. Like I said, great throw from Burrow trying to find the hole in the defense. Tight end gets one foot down, but not the second leaving as little space as possible. A couple things to mention here. The following guys were not necessarily supposed to be starters for the Ravens in 2023 are Darius Washington and Ronald Darby, who ended up having a fantastic season for the Ravens as a veteran corner. So the expectation level in terms of who can execute all the multiple coverage that, coverages that are there is high. You have to, otherwise you won't be on the field. So the Seahawks, I think, are looking at a real paradigm shift for their players in terms of having to execute dozens of coverages, maybe not dozens, but dozens of versions of coverages, if you will. Uh, this is the same one, two deep, four under from a mug look, third and long against the Browns in a home loss for the Ravens. Just briefly, two deep, four under look. Unfortunately for the Ravens, it's going to be a first down to David and Joku. I would say that McDonald's scheme has a couple of, of known weaknesses, and I will try to later on in the video uh, declare three of them, but here's a hint to one. Tight end, delayed routes on third and long. In this case, it happens to be uh, third and 10. And David Njoku, who's a load to try to tackle anyway, is able to gain the first down. What you're here for, hopefully, as a Seahawks fan, is trying to determine what's, what's my team going to play and what can my players do. My point in showing you the Marcus Williams and Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison stuff on the first two plays, and then Jadavion Clowney dropping out on the third play is now you have an eight. Excuse me, now you have a typical usage of players. You have a corner, you have two inside linebackers dropping on the hash, and then another corner in the flats up to the top side. Free safety in Marcus Williams, strong safety in Geno Stone guy who's a little bit more uh, multiple at times. It's still a two-deep four-under, which is somewhat of an anomaly in terms of coverage. Prepare yourself, Seattle fans. You're going to see not just different coverages on every snap. You're going to see different players executing each responsibility within that coverage from play to play as well. I will move and transition a little bit here to a uh, really interesting blitz slash coverage that Mike McDonald uses, oftentimes on third down, but 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 occasionally on fourth. And Seahawks may, fans may actually remember this one. This is a first possession against the Ravens. It's a third and four. It's going to go down as a drop um, on the right sideline to, I think, JSN. Pre-snap on a third and four again. Looks like a mug look. Another aside to mention to you here. 
Uh, that's Daryl Worley, who's a very underrated football player, but in no way, shape, or form was projected to be as a starter for the Ravens in 2023. So w- during my long intro, I mentioned that I think the system is foolproofed or built in to have backup players be capable of performing and executing. This is another example. Daryl Worley played extremely well for the Ravens when he was asked to uh, perform in 2023. Late in the season when everyone was healthy, he didn't get as many opportunities. So this is called a glitch blitz, if you ask me. You're getting a stunt off the edge by a free safety, in this case Kyle Hamilton. I call this a glitch blitz. And then the D tackles are going to drop out and get in windows for any crossers. I'll show you three or four examples of this one, but look at what you've got. You've got Justin Matabike and Michael Pierce, two D tackles, dropping out, looking for work. Now, why is his back turned? Because he's looking for a crosser to impede, to get in the way of, not to KO or knock on the ground, but he's looking for someone to get in the window of and remove as a potential route option for Geno Smith. You can see that Kyle Hamilton has got to the quarterback to try to disrupt him. Ball out ends up being a drop. Show you at least three more versions of this one. This is Detroit week seven. I call it the glitch blitz. You may call it whatever you wish. Off the edge, nickel blitz. And then the two D tackles lined up on the interior are going to engage with the offensive lineman. In this case, Travis Jones and Broderick Washington, two totally separate players from the previous play that I showed you. So again, everyone has to be able to execute their assignment and then they're dropping out in coverage. Now, another additional thing to mention here is that you're going to see a lot of man to the boundary. So as Jamison Williams motions through, you're going to see man here with Humphrey on the tight end, Laporta, and then man here with Queen on the running back. You will see a lot of man and what what some people would call mixed coverages. Now, this appears to be man all over the place to the top side, the field, and the bottom, along with some chaotic defensive tackles dropping. So people say, well, what coverage is this? You have zone dropping D tackles. It's just a way to get to a four-man rush from a, and be as unpredictable as possible. In this case, you get a sack by Arthur Millette, who played really well for the Ravens in 2023 also. From, from a Seahawks fan's perspective, you don't care about Ravens players, but I'm using Ravens film and mentioning multiple unheralded, underrated guys, Ronald Darby, Ardarius Washington, Daryl Worley, Arthur Millette, to show you that anyone can play in the system, assuming that they, first of all, have NFL-level talent. Another version of the glitch blitz, this against the Texans in the playoffs, obviously, division round 2023. You can see Millette lined up to the stack twins. He's going to blitz off the edge. I think he takes a bad angle here. And then two interior tackles, this time Matabike and Travis Jones. You can see that they have got hands out on the offensive lineman to force them to engage. And then they're dropping out while you have, again, man coverage across the board, and help in the middle of the field. This time you have a five-man rush. C.J. Stroud is able to escape it because he's a super talented young man. Ends up being an incompletion on a third down. Fourth and five late in the game this time. Same blitz. You can see the situation. Third downs, fourth downs. That's when McDonald uses the glitch blitz. Uh, Whatever it ends up being called by fans and content creators uh, in Seattle, I don't know. It's an empty formation. Three by two. The guys you want to focus on is Millette as the blitzer. And then 2D tackles dropping out. I think McDonald is creating built-in safeguards in areas of the field such that his DBs know, I'll have a little bit of help in here so that the quarterback can't have a clean angle, clean lane to throw the football. In this case, he has to throw it over the top of Justin Matabike, who, by the way, has 13-plus sacks in 2023. Nonetheless, Mike McDonald expects him to drop out in coverage. It's a team-oriented philosophy. This is the same play, end zone angle. Team-oriented philosophy. I think that will appeal uh, to, to Seattle fans. You can see Millette off the edge, clean and free. Two D tackles dropping out of there, and I think if I pause it at the right time, you get a great idea of how those D tackles dropping out of there can get in the window of quarterbacks throwing the football through a clean lane 
and you got a nice quarterback hit by Millette over the middle on a fourth down that pretty much seals the game for the Ravens. That's an idea of how Mike McDonald's defense operates from a too high structure generally. And then the mug looks, two of the options you're going to get post-snap that are somewhat anomalous. The two deep, four under coverage that I showed you two plays of against the Bengals. And then the glitch blitz where two defensive tackles are occupying interior offensive linemen with a complimentary nickel blitz off the edge. One thing that you're going to see a lot of and that I think will also lead to some interesting conversations between Mike McDonald and Pete Carroll is you're going to see a ton of different versions of cover three. Of course, Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl victory, their two Super Bowl visits, was defined by uh, one high safety looks and cover three. Mike McDonald from a two high safety structure is going to play a ton of cover three. So what that means is one of these safeties is going to insert down somewhere into the second level of the defense. In this case, to the field on a second and 14 early in the season against the Cincinnati Bengals. Geno Stone dropping down to the field to deliver a hit on Trevor Boyd. So the four under uh, delineation is right here. You got a zone turn by the corner up to the top. Yes, you do have a man turn down here, but it's to the backside, the single receiver side. And then Kyle Hamilton, in my opinion, should be rolling a little bit quicker uh, to the middle of the field as the free safety, but he's reading the quarterback. So you get a nice, clear look, I think, here of your four-man rush, four under coverage, three deep. Run it back one more time so you can see an element that you'll uh, see a lot of in 2024 starting in training camp is the boundary side outside linebacker. If he's a more limited athlete from an agility standpoint in coverage, that guy will be dropping a lot. Once Mike McDonald gets his hands on someone like probably Uchenna Nwosu, who's very agile and very quick, you could line him up to the field and do the same thing. Previously, he's done this with a guy named uh, Tyus Bowser and then this past year with Kyle Van Noy. Same game, again, ball on the left hash. The guy dropping out from the uh, second level, or from the first level, excuse me, to the second level, Jadavion Clowney. This one actually doesn't work out well in the Ravens' favor. So what that means is, is that since the outside linebacker from the boundary is dropping out, then it's the safety to the field who is spinning down. Let you see it one more time from start to finish in terms of the drop exchange. And then what that allows you to do is bring a second level blitzer to be, I would say, what's called a safe four-man blitz. It's still only a four-man rush, but because you're alternating who's blitzing, in this case the nickel, while the OLB to the boundary is dropping out, field side safety is replacing the nickel in that curl flat drop. And you get a little bit better look at it here, even though you don't have depth from this corner he, deep, he's not going to be this deep if there's no one in that area to deal with. This is a man coverage on the backside. It's again, again uh, to the boundary with Brandon Stevens on the backside X receiver, in this case T. Higgins. Burrow gets out of there. Like I said, it's a safe blitz is the way I would describe it. You may have a better word or phrase for it. It's a way to be unpredictable and still sound in coverage. A four-man rush, but alternating who is the, the fourth blitzer and then dropping out an outside linebacker D-end to give the quarterback some pause. And this next play, I think, will give you a great um, illustration of what I mean by that. And keep in mind, these two clips I just showed you of cover three with Jadavion Cl Clowney dropping, that was in week two. This one is at home late in the season. Still Joe Burrow at quarterback. Jadavion Clowney to the boundary. All of the options, all of the coverage variability makes it such that even though Joe Burrow has seen this before, He's not throwing this football to the backside X because Jadavion Clowney is just outside of the window or just close enough to the throwing lane such that Burrow has to hold on to the ball and take a sack. That play right there, along with the previous two that I illustrated to you, I think is a very clear example of what Mike McDonald's system can and will do to NFL quarterbacks. Even if they've seen it before, there will be times where it's not confusion on the behalf of the quarterback. It's an extra two-tenths of a second where he has to in confirm that nothing is going to be in the window. In this case, there is a player, the boundary side outside linebacker in the window. Kyle Hamilton was now the nickel. He blitzed. The field side safety dropped down. Exact same thing as what happened on the previous play when Burrow scrambled out of there earlier in the season. Hopefully I explained that to you in a way that makes sense. They're going to play a lot of cover three. Going to have a lot of different variations of it. This one is very 
normal. It's very structured. You have four guys on the line of scrimmage. In this case, three down linemen and then one outside linebacker, uh, Odafe Owe. <clears throat> it's a 3-4 structure, but Malik Harrison is the boundary side um, outside linebacker, if you will, and they walk him back. This is another thing that I think you'll see. So your three down lineman is right here. Field side outside linebacker is Odafe Owe. Boundary side outside linebacker is Harrison. He would normally be have his feet here, but they've kicked him back to create what really looks like a 4-3 look with a strong safety rolled up to the field because you have base personnel on the field for the defense. I'll pause it here in a moment so you can see the more generic version of cover three. Four under, three deep, and in this case, Brandon Ayuk runs a great route, brings it back to the sideline, is able to get open, and Brock Purdy hits him late in the season for a big game. Multiple versions of cover three. That one in particular there is quite vanilla. All right, slightly different uh, situations here for cover three. So now you have the strong safety inserting, but inserting down into the hook area. Very similar to the first one that I showed you. This is going to be Chuck Clark inserting down to the left hash for the defense. Really, the hash is here, so he's you know a little bit outside of it. Kyle Hamilton and Patrick Queen are going to fly out to the flats, first threat to the flats. And I would call this a switch cover three. So very different from the vanilla one that you just shown, I just showed you, even though it ends up being a three deep and four under. Again, this is 2022 film. <clears throat> so that's Marlon Humphrey on the tackle. So what I would say about this being a switch blitz is Patrick Queen is going to run out to the flat. So that right hash is vacated. Well, Roquan Smith takes that over. Think of like a domino effect. And so since Roquan Smith, where his feet are now, he ends up on the right hash. Obviously, you get it. The strong safety, in this case, the left strong safety, uh, Chuck Clark, he's going to drop down and take over Roquan Smith's pass drop. So by alignment, Queen would have had this coverage. Roquan Smith would have had this coverage. Chuck Clark's feet was originally in this area. So all Mike McDonald does is play a shell game, not just of different coverages, but different versions of the same coverage. And here's one more. It's conceptually similar to the first two that I showed you with Jadavion Clowney dropping out again. This is 2022 film. So Clowney is not on the team. Ball on the right hash. <clears throat> Clowney would have been here in the first two plays that I showed you. Well, this is still cover three. In fact, it's still a switch cover three, but now they're rolling down the safety to the boundary. All of this had a huge impact on Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. It doesn't mean they stopped Joe Burrow. They shut him down. He's a super talented quarterback who processes things quickly. But what it does is it forces him to hesitate just slightly longer than he would have if he knew the coverage. And by that time, the pass rush can get there. So Tyce Bowser is dropping out to the field, taking over Roquan Smith's drop. Patrick Queen is blitzing from the boundary. So because Patrick Queen is blitzing from the boundary, you have this switch cover three. Roquan Smith was originally lined up here. Tyus Bowser was originally lined up on the line of scrimmage in this area. So you have these guys switching responsibilities, Bowser, Smith, and Queen, and it's a domino effect. Because Queen is blitzing, the strong safety Chuck Clark again is dropping down, and you just have another way to get to a cover three with three deep, and then the free safety, and then four under. Now, Chuck Clark's drop is obviously a little bit deeper than the other three, but that's because he's coming from depth as a two-high safety. My original assertion was that you're going to see a lot of two-high safety shells, and that's what I'm trying to focus on here. But you can see, hopefully, that Mike McDonald is going to be... Look, every NFL team plays multiple coverages. I think it's extra layers to what Mike McDonald does. He's got three or four anomalous coverages, the glitch blitz, glitch blitz, the two deep four under. Along with that, he's got multiple versions of each coverage such that your players are going to have to be versatile and absolutely locked in to be able to execute those things. The moment he finds a, a field side outside linebacker who can drop and do these things like Tyus Bowser could, I think that unlocks more coverages being available 
the moment Mike McDonald's defense showed up in its current form in 2022, it had an impact. We had no ability to stop Joe Burrow and the Bengals in 2021 with better talent in 2022 at the DB level. Clearly, Mike McDonald was able to deploy guys in multiple locations and force Burrow to hold on to the ball just slightly longer such that the pass rush could get there and actually be a factor. That, I think, is what the system is about, and I think that's what you're going to see show up in Seattle uh, sooner rather than later. A lot of the plays that we focused on so far have been third downs or in some cases like the glitch blitz, uh, fourth and five against the Texans, so a couple of first and tens. He's not afraid and, and will, in fact, use mug looks on first and ten. This is obviously the Ravens' home win against Seattle in week nine. First and ten, fourth possession for the Seahawks. And you can see a mug look by the Ravens whereby there's seven players lined up on the line of scrimmage. No idea who's blitzing, who's dropping out. In this case, it ends up being quite typical, if you ask me. Still a four-man rush. Patrick Queen. Roquan Smith and Kyle Hamilton are the guys dropping out. And in this case, Hamilton and Brandon Stevens are funneling one and two into the safety. And Geno Smith's throw obviously is, you know, quite high. Geno Stone is able to go get the football. Everything is built off of pre-snap looks changing and oftentimes changing twice. In this case, you got great leverage by Hamilton funneling number two in and also outside leverage by Stevens funneling two out so that you're getting these two guys in a tunnel or a funnel into the safety, feeding him into the safety. And in this case, Ravens end up with an interception. So it's not like you're only going to get multiple looks on third down. Things are going to be versatile. Second and eight, very next possession after that interception, another mug look by the Ravens. <clears throat> another example of the nickel defender, and the two inside linebackers dropping out. I'm showing you this play to illustrate that this is end zone, same play. Now Kyle Hamilton is out here as a two-high safety, whereas on the previous snap that I showed you, the interception by Geno Stone, he was the nickel defender. We'll run the all-22 back here in a moment. Ends up being a sack for Odafe Owe on a, on a beautiful spin move against the left tackle. I think the guy who, one of the guys, that the two guys actually, that this system could benefit the most is Mafe and Nwosu. I know Nwosu's recovering from a pec injury, but these coverage variabilities and how multiple they'll be only helps out the guys up front and will generate, um, if you ask me, career-high sack numbers for certain guys. So again, Hamilton is not the nickel this time. He's the boundary side safety. Arthur Millette is the nickel. So what ends up looking like <clears throat> very similar a coverage to the previous play. The only difference is since you have DK Metcalf <clears throat> and a second receiver over to the boundary, the Ravens have kept two DBs, a corner and a safety over there to help out with DK Metcalf because he's such a threat. And then again, man coverage by Patrick Queen, the will linebacker into the boundary, whoever that player is uh, for Seattle this year, much will be asked of him in terms of coverage to the boundary. In this case, you can see Patrick Queen is lined up over a tight end playing man on him, while Hamilton and the boundary side corner are locked in on DK Metcalf to give Geno Smith basically zero opportunity uh, to get that guy the football. Of course, any NFL defense has to be able to run uh, zone blitzes. Three deep, three under, so we'll give you a couple here. This one isn't clean in terms of being able to see the delineation of the defense, 3D, 3-under. Like some of the cover three stuff, it was very easy for me uh, post-snap to draw, you know, four players here and then, you know, three players there in to indicate a 3D, 4-under coverage. This is a zone blitz. Patrick Queen is zone blitzing from the field. Roquan Smith is doing a fantastic job carrying number three vertical long enough to force him to his outside. And then from the boundary, you've got an outside linebacker dropping out and a corner with great awareness to help deal with a potential climb route uh, from George Pickens. And in this case, Kenny Pickett ends up getting a sack. You can see there's no one open soon enough on what looks to me to be a second and four. Another three deep, three under. This one against the Browns. I think this also kind of illustrates the, the nature of tight ends being open late after chips. It's a third and long. Ends up being an incomplete pass. 
huge hit. Additionally, one thing that Patrick Queen was brilliant at uh, with the Ravens, and who knows where he's going to end up, and that you will see a lot of in Seattle, is these picks. So he's going to pick an offensive lineman such that Roquan Smith can fold underneath or behind that as the second portion of a two-linebacker blitz. So there's the pick by Queen. I should have given you the end zone angle. My apologies. Picking the left guard, which takes the running back with him. And then you can see perfectly timed up. Smith is going to loop under and go hit the quarterback quite violently um, on a third and long. Big win by the Ravens in week four at Cleveland. Very versatile system, very aggressive, allows the players to attack. When I say that the Ravens are running plays, this is what I mean. You're not just getting nice three deep, three under coverage. You're getting a game being run up at the front that adds another layer for the quarterback and the offensive line to consider. It's a shell game inside of another shell game inside of a shell, another shell game. And Mike McDonald in his two years as defensive coordinator with the Ravens illustrated immense potential in these situations. This is from week one, and this is just something to show you in terms of the mug looks, in terms of Patrick Queen. Uh, but what Mike McDonald will ask, another mug look, third and long against the Texans before people, uh, certain people knew how good C.J. Stroud was. Look at Patrick Queen from depth at the line of scrimmage, carry three vertical, and then pass him off, and then now run with the dig from the other side as C.J. Stroud is being uh, funneled out by our Darius Washington's blitz. Give you the end zone angle of this one. It's a high level of expectation that Mike McDonald has for his players. They have to be able to execute multiple techniques um, inside of each coverage. So however things are being taught in practice, however they're being reviewed on Saturdays or talked about in film studies, has to be a lot of fun to observe and watch. It's clearly fun for these guys to play in this system. Nickel blitz off the edge, Ardarius Washington. No glitch blitz, meaning the D tackles aren't dropping out, just your typical um, nickel stunt off the edge. And a beautiful job by Patrick Queen of carrying three vertical and then folding underneath uh, to the dig. There's other coverages that I could show you. I have a man coverage situations. Everything is everything is organized on my uh, computer such that I can create content and show videos as quickly as I want. The last thing that I'll mention, and who knows what uh, Julian Love and some of these other guys will, will turn into under Mike McDonald's structure. The moment he gets his hands on someone in Seattle like a, like a Kyle Hamilton, which there's not a whole lot of Kyle Hamiltons out there, then I think the, the coverage net becomes even wider for other teams to consider. So give you a couple of plays of Kyle Hamilton being utilized expertly. This is another Tampa 2, very similar to the first two plays I showed you in this video, whereby Marcus Williams and then Patrick Queen are dropping out to run in between the hash. In this case, Queen is on the field. Roquan Smith is on the field. They're dropping to the hash, and Hamilton is the guy running the middle third in a Tampa 2. So Tampa 2 has a 2 in it, so you think there's 50% of the deep portion of the field being covered by each player, each safety. In this case, it's kind of an illusion because you have a third player responsible for running the middle third of the field, which mathematically doesn't work. 50%, 50%, and then 33.33 repeating percent doesn't work out. But this, to me, is what makes the Tampa 2 so brilliant because you have a player, in this case Kyle Hamilton, and in the previous plays I showed you earlier in the video, Patrick Queen and Marcus Williams, who can run that area but also line up at nickel or line up on the second level of the defense, if you will, tells you how freaking amazing Derek Brooks must have been for the Tampa Bay Bucks when he was playing Mike Linebacker responsible for the deep middle of the field, if you will, in a Tampa 2. Kyle Hamilton is lined up as the nickel to the field. In this case, 12 personnel for the uh, 49ers, and the Ravens kind of start to roll to a one-high look, come back to a two-high safety look, and you can see the confusion that this presents to teams, especially teams that see it for the first time. Now, I will say to you that I have some concerns about uh, Mike McDonald's defense when you can't see the football. So when the quarterback is not in the shotgun, when he's under center, to me there has been a difference in how these guys react. It doesn't mean that they play poorly. They just don't play to 
115% speed like all of the most of the plays that you're seeing here. And from a Seahawks perspective, you have two teams in your division that operate under center, particularly one, the Los Angeles Rams. And that team gave the Ravens significant trouble in Baltimore this year. The system that Mike McDonald runs, I think, is built to stop shotgun offenses and the modern passing game, particularly out of 11 personnel. Some of the teams that are anomalous under center with more quarterback uh, back to the defense play action, I think present <clears throat> little different problems or equations for him to solve. Nonetheless, a great signing from the standpoint of what the defensive scheme will be, what will be asked of the players. I firmly believe, and I think Mike McDonald does too, that if you have high expectations for people and you ask them to meet multiple deadlines, multiple responsibilities at the same time, that they will generally live up to that. And in the case of the Ravens the last two years and Michigan in 2021, <clears throat> all of those players did that. There's no reason why Seattle's defense can't have an exponential jump, especially after six, eight, or maybe nine games in 2024. On the offensive side, I have no idea what Mike McDonald will bring in in terms of offensive coordinator hire, nor do I have any idea what the scheme will look like. I am excited for you as a Seahawks fan that you've got a guy who has a system and that has used that system in college at Michigan and in the pros with the Ravens. So he knows where the pitfalls are, and I think with the talent that's there on the defensive side of the ball, uh, Seattle is going to be a force to be reckoned with next year, not just in the division, but in the NFC. I appreciate you guys' time, man. Uh, forgive me for not um, having any offensive film, but there's really nothing to say in terms of what he might do on the offensive side. I brought you the film that I could and tried to project for you uh, what it could look like with the personnel that's there on the defensive side of the ball, which I think is a significantly talented group. And Seattle fans should be really happy with the merging of McDonald's system and those young players who already play very fast and very aggressive and are fun to watch. I appreciate you guys' time. If you think that this video was uh, fun for you to watch and you think other Seahawks fans might enjoy it, please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media so other Seattle fans can enjoy it as well.